If you've got a Bible, I look forward to opening up with you. Let's turn to the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And I'm going to ask you to turn to the easiest passage you will ever find in any sermon, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. If you ever come to church and get nervous that the pastor is going to ask you to turn to a small book in the Old Testament that you're not sure where it is, have no fear. Genesis is here today. And uh, today I want to talk to you about the gospel of Genesis 1-1. The Gospel of Genesis 1-1. In my estimation, there's perhaps no greater book in the Old Testament than the book of Genesis. In fact, I think you can make a case that it is a top two to three significant book in the entire Bible, both Old and New Testament, because everything we believe about the rest of the Bible finds its foundation in the book of Genesis. We find out significant things like the nature of God. We learn about marriage. We learn about gender identity. All these things that are current issues in our culture, we find here at the beginning in Genesis. I want us just to read our passage. We're going to read it several times today, and then I just want us to dive deep. But let's just do an initial reading together. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you were raised in church, perhaps this was one of the earliest verses that you ever came to memorize as a child. And you may even wonder why a guest preacher is opening up to the very first verse of the Bible in such a simple verse and such a short verse. And you may be wondering, well, what in the world does Genesis 1-1 have to do with me? In fact, you may even wrestle with me in your heart right now thinking, Nick, I, I came to church to be ministered to, to have God speak to me. I'm really walking through a lot. What does Genesis 1-1 have to do with my life? And here would be my response. It has everything to do with your life. And I really believe that when you understand Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it brings light to every single issue in your Christian walk. When you read the book of Genesis, I really think you need to read Genesis chapter 1 through 3 all together because it really is connected inwardly and you you really can't separate those three chapters. In fact, I think you understand Genesis 1, 1 better when you understand Genesis 1 through 3 better. And I would go even so far out on a limb to say this, if you get Genesis chapter 1 through 3 wrong, you get the rest of the Bible wrong. If you're a a builder or an architect in the room today, you would tell us a lot of things about building an appropriate house or a a commercial building, but perhaps the the most important thing that you would tell us would, would be this, that if you get the foundation wrong, the rest of the building will be wrong. That's the way you can look at Genesis chapter 1 through 3. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, I just want you to think about it like this. This is God's perfect world. This shows His original design, His original intent, and everything's good. You have two people who are unmarred by skin, living in a, uh, by sin in a perfect relationship with God. They're, they're naming the animals. They have dominion over the Garden of Eden. And God just tells them one thing. If you remember what he tells Adam and Eve, hey, you see that tree in the distance? You can eat of anything else in the, in the garden. Just don't eat of that tree. If you've ever wondered how we got from that perfect situation to the world in which we live, in which tragedy reigns freely, then you must understand Genesis chapter 3. In fact, again, I think you understand Genesis 1-1 better when you understand Genesis chapter 3. So flip over to Genesis chapter 3. Just one verse, or excuse me, just one page there. And let's recount the fall of man here together. It says in chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent, that's Satan, he was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say... You shall not eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. You realize that Satan always brings two things towards the Word of God. You know what they are? Doubt and denial. Every single time. He has been doing it from the beginning and he is still doing it now. Think back to this passage. You see the aspect of doubt here. Did God really say that? I mean, did he really mean that you couldn't eat of any, like like just that one tree? Did he actually say that? Just causes doubt. He denies just the word of God. God says, you eat of the tree and you will die. And what does he do? He just flat out denies what God had said. Listen, when you eat of it, you will not die. In fact, you will become like God. He's been doing the same thing all this time until the present moment. And I would just, just a little side note here. If you ever find yourself doubting 
a bit of the Word of God or denying a bit of the Word of God is the work of the serpent now present in your life. When you think about this passage, what you got to understand is because of the foundational nature of the book of Genesis, some of these things that Satan is causing doubt and denial towards are some of these key things that we find in this book. Perhaps it's Genesis 1.1. I mean, can we really believe that there was a God who, who really did just create the world in six days? I mean, this is a world so big, right? I mean, could he really do that? You think about Genesis chapter 1 and 2. I mean, is marriage really between a man and a woman? And he's just causing doubt and denial towards all of these things. Um, Satan wants us to doubt Genesis 1-1 because in my estimation, again, Genesis chapter 1-1 is the foundation for evangelism. Do you realize that if we were in, in a missionary context today, we would most likely, when we shared the gospel, we would not do that like we do that in Memphis or we would not do that like we do uh, in Fayetteville, Arkansas. We wouldn't start with the aspect of, hey, do you realize that you're a sinner? There's at least some context of sin here where people would probably rattle off, well, what's the bad things you do, Right? In a missionary setting, there is no concept of sin many times in these cultures. And so to start there is to, is to miss the boat. And what many missionaries often do, you know where they begin? They begin Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Do you realize that there's a God who, who created you, who knows everything about you, and who has orchestrated everything in your life to bring you into a relationship with you, and he wants to come into a relationship with you today? That's how they would begin a gospel presentation. In fact, if you're here today and you would just freely admit, Nick, I I'm not a Christian. Somebody brought me here or invited me here. I just kind of stumbled in here. I'm not even sure why I'm here. Here's what I would start with today. There's a creator God who we just read about who loves you and who has orchestrated every single thing in your life. And he has carried you through the good and the bad like we sung about just a moment ago to bring you to this place called Bellevue that you may hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and have your entire life changed. And so today, if you're here and you don't know Christ, this message is for you. I would say today, if you're a Christian, this message is, is also for you. Maybe you are having questions about creation. Maybe you've even doubted the creation account. Maybe you struggle with it. Maybe you just want to be able to defend your faith better among skeptics of the faith, well, this message is for you. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through this passage several times, and each time we do that, on the screen, I'm just going to underline a different word that we're going to focus on. We're just going to work our way through Genesis 1-1 and what this really has to do with your life and with my life. So let's begin together. Let's read it again. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's a professor called, uh, named Robert Berg, and he's a distinguished professor of Old Testament and Hebrew at Hannibal LaGrange University. Uh, he points out that in Hebrew, Genesis 1-1 is seven words. And so he says these seven Hebrew words give us seven truths that we can understand about, uh, about the Lord. And so if you're a note taker, I'm just going to ask you to write these quick. I'm going to roll through these very quickly. But here's number one. Number one of seven truths. Number one is this. God exists. God exists. This is taken and understood by faith. Let me remind you of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the most familiar passage on faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For here's the key part. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That is the message of the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Number two is this. God existed before there was a universe We'll talk about this here in just a moment, but he existed before there was anything else. Truth number three we learn is this, that God is the main character in the Bible. It begins with him. It's in the middle of the Bible. He is all throughout the Bible. The Bible ends with him. It is a book that revolves around the Lord. Number four is this, God is the creator and did what no human could do. We'll talk about that aspect as well. Uh, have you attempted to create an animal lately? Anybody in the room? Anybody attempted to create a mountain recently? I mean, it's, it's a hard deal, right? Only God can create. Think about another uh, truth. The fifth truth here is God is mysterious. Genesis 1-1 gives us this picture. Interestingly, when you look at this in the original language, when you look at it in Hebrew, linguistically, this points to the Trinity. So the, the plural use of the word for God here is, is Elohim. So the plural use is used here referencing God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If you've ever wondered, well, where is Jesus at the beginning? He is right there and he is creating. 
When speaking of creation, it uses the singular form. And so it's this mysterious picture of of three in one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, the Trinity is creating. Truth number six is this, God created something out of nothing. If you've ever heard the, the Latin phrase ex nihilo, this means out of nothing. This is where this comes from. And then finally, number seven perhaps is my favorite. It's this, that God is not dependent on the universe, but the universe is totally dependent on God. You know, when you think about what Genesis is, Genesis is a book about the beginning. Anytime we talk about the genesis of something, that's exactly what we're saying. This is how it all began. And people for a long time have been trying to figure out, well, how did the beginning of the world really start? I mean, why are we all here? How did this all begin? And many modern day scientists and scientists for years have come up with what we know as the Big Bang Theory, right? Dr. Robert Jastrow was a professor of earth sciences at Dartmouth in the 70s. He was a leading NASA scientist and a planetary physicist. He, he wrote this about the Big Bang Theory to put us all on equal ground here about what this is. He wrote this, that all matter in the universe was compressed into an infinitely dense and hot mass that exploded. Over many eons, supposedly, the primordial cloud of the universe expands and cools. Stars are born and die. The sun and earth are formed and life arises on the earth. I mean, is this not what you were taught in junior high and in high school? This is most likely what was reaffirmed in your college days that, that listen, life just happened. It just is an accident here. And so with so many scientists saying so many things about the Big Bang Theory and how the world began, I just got a real question for us that, that followers of Christ have to wrestle with of how do we line that up with, with Genesis chapter 1 verse 1? I mean, how are we supposed to wrestle with these things? I would say that there are three options for you today, okay? Um, not all of them are good options, but they're options nonetheless, okay? Number one is this, you can reject everything in the Bible. You can reject everything in the Bible. That's what many people do. There's no way I could believe, with all these scientists saying all these things, there's no way that I could, could go against that and believe that there really is a God who's a creator. You, you can reject everything in the Bible. Uh, number two, I, I said this one this way, you can just go cafeteria style with the Bible, you can go cafeteria style with the Bible. Now, uh, the, the older I get, the more appealing a cafeteria is, I've got to be honest. Uh, when I was a child, my, we had a Luby's connected to our mall. My dad would always take us to Luby's. And as a child, you know, you, you're just not that much, you know, you, you don't love Luby's, right? You'd rather have something like Chick-fil-A. Uh, I can even remember in college when I'd have to go to, down to the cafeteria, be like, man, I, I'd rather go out and get KFC than, they, you know, than, than the cafeteria. But the older I get, the better it sounds, right? Because I can go and I can, I'll take a little roast beef today. That chicken looks good. I'll take, uh, give me some mac and cheese. Actually, double, double helping there, mac and cheese. And then I get to close with what every child loves and, and every adult, if you're honest. We all love Jell-O, right? And cafeterias are famous for Jell-O. Honestly, this is the way that, that many people treat the Word of God. I'm not down with the Genesis account. I don't like that. I, I, love, I love Jesus. The fact that he died for me, like I'm, I'm down with that. I, I like the resurrection. I love the fact that God is, is sovereign. He's a refuge in time of trouble. I don't like the purity stuff. And, and so you can go cafeteria style with the Bible, but, but really if we're, if we're being intellectually honest, that's something, but it's not Christianity. Finally, you, there's the option of what, what I'm going to give you and what I'm going to portray to you today is that you need to believe everything in the Bible. Believe everything in the Bible. That's your third option. As Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says this, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What in the world are we supposed to believe? How do we wrestle with Genesis 1.1? How do we really know what happened all those years ago? Well, that's where I believe Genesis 1-1 comes into play. And we believe that the Bible answers those questions. And here's what we also believe, that the Bible revolves around God. Let's read this passage again. It says this, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. My son just got a new Bible the other day, and he said, I'm going to go, and I'm going to highlight every time it says God. That's a pretty good practice for Scripture, right? I'd encourage you, highlight this, underline this. At the beginning of it all, God was. Before there was anything, 
He was. This is the message of Psalm chapter 90. It says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before it was, He was. I've been telling our church back in Fayetteville uh, a statement for many months now, and it just seems like it keeps popping up through the various series that we're, that we're walking through and are preaching. And I, I continually tell them this, God is entirely unlike you. He's entirely unlike you. You see, we are made in the image of God that, that is not reversed. God is not made in our image. And many times as a follower of Christ, when we struggle, what, what a testimony we heard earlier, by the way, on video. I'm sure this this dear sister in Christ wrestled with what God was doing, struggled with what God was doing. And many times all of us have the temptation to put God in in the box of humanity. Well, I wouldn't operate that way, right? I wouldn't do it that way. And that's a slippery slope to be on because God is entirely unlike us. But thankfully, in His grace, He gave us a picture of who He was. His name is Jesus Christ, who came and shed His blood for us on the cross, rose from the grave so that we could find a relationship with God. In the beginning, God was there and he was about to get to work. Let's read the passage again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He is a creator. It's the very first picture we are ever given of God that he is a creator here. It is the core of who he is. You say, well, Nick, what does God create in the Scriptures? Thank you for asking. Let me, let me tell you th- two things that God creates in the Scriptures. Number one is this. He creates something out of nothing. He creates something out of nothing. Uh, the Hebrew word for this word for created is the word bara. Bara. You say, well, Nick, I borrowed something from my neighbor yesterday, okay? A little bit of di- different meaning there, right? Um, this is referencing what God does. Whenever you see that word, it references what God does. And, and the Hebrew even emphasizes this, uh, this truth, that what was formed was new and perfect. You see, when God does something, He does it right. Amen? I mean, He's perfect. In, in fact, you read this as you read the creation account. And, and there's only one thing that God said wasn't good. You realize that? Like, He goes day by day, and He creates everything. He's like, and it was good. And it was good. And it was good. Ladies, did you realize that there's only thing that, that God said what, wasn't good? He looked at the man, and, he, and, it, and it, uh, in Hebrew, it, it means this. Ain't something right about that guy. Okay, like, <laughs> just something's off. And what does he do? He creates a companion. He creates Eve, and they come together. He creates something out of nothing. I love this second thing. We see this when we get to the New Testament. He makes us into new creations at salvation. New creations Think about all the things that Paul could have mentioned here. All the declarations of salvation, everything that he could have put right here. What did he call you? You are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Anybody thankful that your old is gone? That your old has passed away and the new has come in your life? What God did in you, what did he make you? He made you into a new creation. Only Jesus can do this in the heart of a person. I wanted to just be clear this morning, um, coming to Bellevue more will not save you. Merely improving your morality will not save you. Putting money on the offering plate as that passes by, it will not save you. Only Jesus can make someone into a new creation. Only God could create something out of nothing, and only God can make people into a new creation. It's interestingly, when, when you look at the Psalms, I've been reading the Psalms just in my devotions this summer. If you haven't been in the Psalms lately, I encourage you to go back to it. What a powerful, powerful book. But when in the Psalms talks about the power of God, you know what it often points to? It talks to, uh, about the, the creating power of God. Case in point, Psalm chapter 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Psalm chapter 95, in his hands are the depths of the earth, the the heights of the mountains are his also, the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the sheep of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. This, This last part is for somebody in the room today. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Think about this passage. It is talking about the creating power of God, and then it gets real personal to the individual. Today, if you hear him knocking on the door of your heart, 
Do not harden your heart. Psalm chapter 139, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance and your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there were none of them. All of these references reference the creating power of God and it points our hearts and our minds' attention back to Genesis 1-1, the gospel of Genesis 1-1. Nobody else could do this. When you think about the creating power of God and you think about Genesis 1-1, let's make this personal this morning. There are some of you, you need God to create something new in your life today. Maybe it's as, as David prayed, God, would you create a new heart in me? God, I've become callous towards the things of you. I've, I've become numb to the things of you. Would, you. would you create a new heart in me? Maybe you need God to create something new in your family. Maybe it's something new at the office. Maybe you have a lost family member or friend who you're desperate for God to save them. You've tried sharing the gospel numerous times and just over and over and over. And they're just not responding. Have hope in this today. Jesus is the one who makes new creations, and there is no lost cause. Let's read the final portion of this verse before we close. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth. This includes the following six days of creation. So, so Genesis chapter 1, 1 is a snapshot, and then you see that more detailed in the rest of Genesis 1. And so this includes everything else for the, for the next six days that God will create. And you could very easily translate and, and use this verse this way. In the beginning, God created everything. Everything. Maybe you've had this genuine question before of, well, why did God put us on earth? Anybody ever wonder that? Like, why the world? Why, why Arkansas? Why Tennessee? Why, why the globe? Why mountains? Why valleys? Why water? Like, why did God do all of these things? And you know, there's a theological reason why he created us and put us in this world. And there's a personal and a practical reason as well. One theologian said it this way, that the world is God's way of revealing more of himself to us. Every pleasure we experience, every sunset that we see, every tasty bit of food, it'd be like this. If tonight there's an amazing sunset here in Memphis and, and you walk outside of your front porch and you say, oh my word, look at this. What a beautiful sunset here in Memphis tonight. It'd be something as simple as, man, did you taste the burger at that new restaurant? It is unbelievable. Did you watch the Grizzlies game last night? Did you see that buzzer beater? It was unreal. You realize what all of these things are? They're snapshots of glory. Snapshots pointing our heart's attention back to the gospel of Genesis 1-1 that there is a creator God who creates us, the world, and every single pleasure in this world that we experience. And ultimately what that pleasure, no matter what it is, is to do is to point our heart's attention and our heart's affection to Jesus who really can be the only satisfaction in our hearts. I want us to close by, by looking at Romans chapter 1. I think Romans chapter 1 and Genesis 1 are connected. And so if you'll turn there with me, we'll close with this passage today. Romans chapter 1 is a fairly familiar passage of Scripture that covers many issues, but it actually speaks to the issue of creation. And it speaks about our own accountability before God because of creation. And so I want us to look at it together, Romans chapter 1. Verse 18, here's what it says. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. If you've got your pen there with your Bible, just underline that last phrase. They suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since what? The creation of the world and the things that have been made. Underline this last phrase as well. So they are without excuse. Here's the picture of these three verses that 
That people who, who do not believe that there is a God, there is a, a constant thing that they do. They, they suppress the truth. It'd be like if this pulpit today is the truth of God, that there's a creator God. It's like they push it down and they continually suppress it. And so I honestly believe it is not so much that so many people do not believe that there's a God, but they want to suppress the truth that there is a God, that there is a creator. And you say, well, Nick, why would somebody do that? Because if Genesis 1-1 is true, that there really is a God who created me and who knows everything about me and who is orchestrating all things in me and in my life into a relationship with Christ, then, then I must bow the knee to this God. I must live like He wants me to and I must submit my life to Him. So people not wanting to do that, what do they do? They, they suppress that truth that they keep it down. The Bible here very simply says it this way, that all these people who witness creation, they're without excuse. So every person within the sound of my voice today, here's what, here's what the passage is saying for you. You are without excuse before a holy God. The passage in Romans is saying this, that, that simply by walking out the back doors today, walking out into the parking lot, seeing a beautiful sky, seeing the pond, seeing the grass, seeing animals, seeing trees, that is enough for the human heart to say, okay, th th there is more to this than I'm living for, and you need to bow the knee to this God. We are held accountable before God from the very first verse of Scripture on. Keep on reading the passage in, in Romans. It says in verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Think about the horror of this passage. I think Romans chapter 1 is a horrifying passage in many ways. For although they knew God, they had a knowledge of God. Maybe they believed that there was a God. Maybe they even believed that Jesus existed. But they have never turned their heart over to Him. In fact, today you, you may be listening to me and you say, Well, Nick, I, I, man, I believe in God. I even believe that Jesus existed. I mean, is that not enough? And nowhere in the Scriptures is knowledge enough. In fact, even the demons believe. Think about what this passage says, because they had a knowledge, they knew God, but they didn't surrender with their heart. Here's the, here's the result, the byproduct of that. Here's what it is. They were futile in their thinking, their hearts were darkened, and claiming to be wise, they became fools. People want to make Genesis 1-1 not really exist. Or they want to make it not true, and they do this often out of an intellectual mindset that says, I know more than what the Bible says. Romans chapter 1 speaks to that and says, listen, these people claiming to be wise, claiming to be know-it-alls, they've become fools. Today, I close with this encouragement to you today to not suppress the truth of the gospel of Genesis 1-1 any longer, to not suppress the truth that God is a creator, that he loves you, that he desires a relationship for you. And that's why he sent Jesus to die on your behalf. You know, you may hear this message and you may be completely resonating with that and say, you know what, Nick, that, that's exactly what I need. And so, so I'm going to start doing some remodel in my own life. I'm going to start coming to Bellevue more. I'm going to start giving to the church financially. I'm going to stop drinking so much. I'm going to stop going out like I've been going out. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to stop cheating on my taxes. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And all that is is a remodel. You ever done a remodel? You can make an old, bad house look great on the outside, but often on the inside, it's a mess, right? The plumbing is all messed up. The foundation is all messed up. You see, you can, you can try to fix the surface of your life by mere morality, but mere morality won't make you into a new creation. God is not calling you to just do a remodel of your life. God is calling for a new construction in your life. Something completely brand new. And there is only one builder. It's not Nick Floyd. It's not Steve Gaines. It is Jesus Christ. And he alone can make you into a new creation.
Would you pray with me today as we close? I'm going to invite our pastors here at Bellevue to go ahead and make their way to the front of each aisle. And here would be my plea to those of you who, if you're honest with yourself, you'd say, Nick, I've never come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I've never surrendered my life. I I believe there's a God, but I've never had that moment of surrender personally before Christ. And today, I feel like God is leading me to do that. I I need to become a new creation. I need God to do that work in me. Man, bless you. God will do that in you today. You may say, well, Nick, well, what does it take for me to do that? You realize that, that Jesus is the only one who does that. And our only proper response to him dying on the cross and rising from the dead is this. That you would take a look at your life and realize you've lived for yourself. And you've lived for sin. But today you're, you're ready to, to take a stand and to turn your back towards a life of selfishness and a life of sin. And you're ready to turn away from that life. The Bible calls that repentance. And you're ready to take a step of faith towards the Lord Jesus. Jesus, I believe that you're the only one who can make me into a new creation. The Bible says when that happens, that, that moment in your life happens of repentance and faith, that Jesus, in the most miraculous thing he's done, far superior to creating the world, he will take you from where you're at. And he will build you into a new creation. He will begin a change today that will carry on for the rest of your life. And so just a moment, I'm going to ask you to come. When we begin to sing, I'm just going to ask you to leave where you're seated. You've got people around you that will support you, that are going to be honored and thrilled that you're making this decision. And you just come to one of these pastors. They're not going to embarrass you. You're not going to have to come on stage and say anything. They're just going to answer any questions you have. They're going to lead you into a relationship with Jesus Christ right at the front of this auditorium today. So when we stand and when we sing in just a moment, you do that. If you're a Christian today, maybe you're burdened today for somebody. Somebody who you need God to do that new creation work in. You've been witnessing, you've been trying, you've been praying. And maybe today just needs to be a point of surrender for you as a follower of Christ. God, I surrender my own inability to save my son, my daughter, my friend, my neighbor. And I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit, would you touch that person? We're going to open up this altar. You can come and you can pray for that person. Maybe you need to just have a a pastor pray with you. That's why these men are here as well. Maybe you've taken that step of of salvation like we talked about, but you've never followed under believer's baptism. Why don't you come and talk to a pastor about that? Maybe your, your child was saved this past week at VBX. I know we had a lot of kids saved. Parents, why don't you bring your child forward and talk to a pastor about what it means to go public with your faith? And finally, if you're here today and you've been looking for a church home, man, you, you've walked into a family setting here. And they're looking for more family members, and they'd be honored if you would come and talk about church membership with this group. You can also come and talk to the pastor. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. And as soon as I get done praying, we're going to stand together and we're going to sing together. And as soon as we begin to sing, I'm just going to ask you to leave where you're seated. And however God has called you to respond, you leave and you come to one of these pastors. Or you come and you just bypass them. You just come to this altar as well, just to pray by yourself. Holy Spirit of God, we pray that you would draw people to close to yourself. Do in them what only you can do. Do new creations. Take Christians to their next step with you. Whatever in the world it looks like. Jesus, we rely on you for this time. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Church, would you stand with us now? If you need to come, you come as we begin to sing.